The following is the presentation of the Canadian Centre for Diversity and Inclusion. All content presented is the exclusive intellectual property of CCDI. Any sharing, reproduction, or use of this material or content as is, or in any form, requires the express written permission of CCDI. Should you wish to use this content in any way, please contact Anne-Marie Pham, CEO at the Canadian Centre for Diversity and Inclusion at annemariefam at ccdi.ca. Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Neelab from CCDI, my pronouns are she and her, and I'll be moderating today's webinar, Allyship, What Type of Ally Are You? Please be reminded that this is an intermediate to advanced level webinar. Individuals are expected to have a basic understanding of allyship. As you can see, we have many webinars coming up, which you can register for at www.ccdi.ca. The Canadian Certified Inclusion Professional, CCIP, certification is a professional designation designed to assess the knowledge and experience of diversity and inclusion professionals against the standard set of predefined competencies. For more information, please visit www.ccdi.ca slash ccip or email ccip.certification at ccdi.ca. The next cohort registration closes on March 19th, 2023. Please note a quick disclaimer, CCDI is not liable for any claims, losses, or damages of any kind arising out of or in any way related to the information provided in the presentation. I will now pass this on to our presenters. Thank you so much, Neelab. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, so before we get into uh, our conversation for today, I wanted to um, open the session by honoring the land on which we gather today. So though this session is brought to you through the internet, um, we are each situated on land that is old and has a lot of stories, and it is important for us to know this. So as an immigrant settler to Canada, it is especially important for me to acknowledge Canada as the land of the First Peoples, the Inuit and the Métis. And I'd like to pay homage to the Indigenous peoples, past, present and future, um, who continue to work to educate and contribute to the strength of this country. So uh, I am joining you from London, Ontario, which is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, the Lenapaiwuk and the Atawandron peoples, on lands connected with the London Township and Sombra Treaties of 1796 and the dish with one spoon covenant wampum. So this land continues to be home to diverse indigenous peoples whom I recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors of our society. Now, I am starting off my session with this acknowledgement um, to show respect and uh, recognition to the people and the nations who have lived here in this place that I now call home. And this is part of my effort to create and establish healthy and reciprocal relations that work towards reconciliation. So if you'd like to learn more about the history and the traditions uh, and the stories of the land on which you live, I highly recommend checking out the Whose Land app to learn more. The link is provided on the slide at the bottom and we can also drop it for you in the chat. All right, so uh, good afternoon, good morning, those of us, uh, those of you who are joining us from different parts of Canada. Uh, thank you again for joining me for this webinar. My name is Sarita Na Akuye Ade, and my pronouns are she and her, and I am a manager for learning and knowledge solutions here at CCDI. So just a bit about me, um, I hold a doctorate in Hispanic studies from the University of Western Ontario. Uh, my educational background, uh, uh, mainly revolves around post-colonial studies, around gender and education. Um, however, my professional experiences have been diverse, uh, mainly in education and research, community development, um, and these are just a few examples. Um, I also do a lot of um, research work in terms of advocacy in anti-racism, and um, a lot of my research work is around highlighting marginalized voices within the Black diaspora. So um, by virtue of my education and my 
my work experiences, I have been privileged to live in different countries uh, on three different continents. So I'm from Ghana. Um, I shuffled between Ghana and Togo. Um, and then I went to Cuba to study and then went to the United States, uh, more studies, and then to Canada for even more, more studies. Um, so um, in a sense, I have been around um, a lot of these cultures and um, these experiences help me to solidify what my personal values are, uh, which is courage, uh, the courage to be oneself in new environments, to practice humility, and to step outside of the boundaries of my own comfort zone. So pretty much um, these are where I get some of my personal values from. Now, for the visually impaired, I'm going to describe myself. I am a lighter skinned black woman with curly brown hair and blonde highlights at the ends. So our webinar for today is about allyship, and we will be looking at what is allyship. We'll also be talking about why we need allyship. Then we will talk about privilege and why it is important to leverage your privilege or even how you can leverage your privilege to be an ally. Then we will look at the types of allies, and then we'll quickly look at a case study, and then we will move into, into our Q&A session. All right, so before we start, um, here's a question that I have for you. I want to know how we are coming into this session. I want to know how each of us is coming into the session. So I have a little poll question for you, and it is this. Um, do you consider yourself an ally? So we have four options here. So Neelab is going to... Um, post the polls, she's going to launch the polls and you are going to see it pop up on your screen. Uh, so kindly answer, um, do you consider yourself an ally? So we're gonna give 30 seconds for this poll. Um, Neelab, uh, please let me know when you have launched the poll. Thank you, Sarita. The poll has been launched. Um, we'll give it another 20 seconds here. Okay, I've shared the results. Okay, all right. Um, so yeah, so it looks like a lot of us already are coming in having a good sense of what it means to be an ally or pretty much what the basics of allyship are. And then there are those of us who are also looking to learn um, how to be better allies. So uh, once again, I just wanna say thank you for participating in this uh, brief poll with me. All right, so now let's quickly delve into why we're here. What is allyship? So um, allyship comes from the word or the concept of alliance. And the definition that we will be working with today comes from CCDI's glossary of terms, and it is as follows. So allyship is advocating for members of social groups outside of your own, especially those that face discrimination, racism, prejudice, and systemic oppression frequently. So allyship then is about advocating for members of social groups outside of your own, um, especially uh, those who face these systems of oppression that you yourself do not face. So um, because we already understand the basics of allyship, um, I just want us to take note of three important things that we need to remember about allyship. So first off, allyship is not sympathy or empathy. So expressing sympathy and empathy towards people who face prejudice or injustice is nice, but making sympathetic comments, it's not really allyship. So for example, sending thoughts and prayers don't change the harsh realities for people who are navigating complex um, systems of oppression. What actually changes things for them is action. Now, the second point I also want us to note about allyship is that effective allyship is based on relationship with the individual, the group, or the community. So allyship is relationship based. And so for us to be effective as allies, we need to have that relationship with the individual that we are allies to or the group or the community. So an ally is more effective when they have that direct connection because then you hear from um, the people in that community that you support, that you advocate for. And because you hear from them directly, you are able to know 
um, how they would like to be supported. Now, the third thing is that allyship requires perspicacity. Now, what is perspicacity? I hear you say. So perspicacity is defined as the ability to see beyond the obvious, to be able to clearly recognize a bias statement, an action or discriminatory practice in the moment. Um, so uh, basically, there have been situations where I have not understood, you know, when a statement, for example, was a microaggression until days after the fact, right? So perspicacity is a quality that we develop over time, and we are able to develop this when we exercise this um, critical judgment more and more. And this way, it helps us to be better at allyship. So now that we know what allyship is, who then is an ally? So pretty much like allyship, an ally is an individual or a person uh, in a position of privilege or power who makes that consistent effort to understand, uh, to uplift, to empower and support individuals from equity deserving groups. So an ally is not a member of that group, but one who is trying to stand in solidarity with an equity deserving group so that they can end oppression, they can end discrimination or prejudice, or pretty much whatever shows up in that context. So again, a couple of things I want us to note about allies, specifically effective allies. So first thing is that allies educate themselves. So being an ally requires self-education. So it can mean you learning on your own about the stigmas, the uh, systems of oppression, the discrimination that um, people face or people from different equity groups uh, face. And then also listening and learning because you're in uh, close proximity to these groups. You're listening and learning how you can support these marginalized group causes. The second thing I want us to note about effective allies is that um, being an effective ally involves a high level of self-reflection and awareness of your own privilege. So being an ally hinges a lot on privilege, privilege that you have that people within that equity seeking group or equity deserving group do, do not have. So in a sense, it is you holding yourself accountable to understand and to push back against these systems of oppression. So again, and it requires understanding how to use your privilege in solidarity without necessarily reinforcing that privilege. Now, the third thing I want us to note about an ally is that an ally is a person who is continuously learning. So being an ally is not a destination. Um, it's a continuous learning opportunity. So this means that you're constantly learning. So remember that if you're advocating for a group that you don't belong to, it will take time to deeply understand the people or the individual, their concerns, their needs, and their causes. And the final point about effective allies that I want to make is that allies are accountable to the group that they support. So because allies have relationships with the groups that they support, they are respectful of the preference of um, equity deserving groups, and they are accountable to members of that group. So for instance, if the group that you support prefer to use the term um, people living with disabilities instead of um, differently abled, please respect that preference and hold yourself accountable to that group or to that person that you have that relationship with. And I have seen a lot of um, debates and arguments online where people are saying this is not the right way to call um, or to refer to a certain group. So this is where you can say this is the relationship I have with X group and this is how they choose to uh, be called. All right, so um, we have talked about allyship and what an effective ally is. Now the question is, why do we need to practice allyship? So we now know that allyship involves effort and intention and that it is because social inequities impact marginalized people in uh, very significant ways. So why then should we practice allyship? So the first reason is because of the impact of social inequalities. So uh, we, we are activating our allyship 
hardships because social inequalities we know negatively impact the well-being of marginalized communities. Now, before the pandemic, these social inequalities existed, but uh, the pandemic especially highlighted how vulnerable uh, marginalized communities were in terms of their access to healthcare, for example, and when faced with economic stress. So again, um, our world is not isolated. Workplaces is not uh, are not isolated from the real world, and our workplaces in themselves can become microcosms of the society that we live in. So as human beings with biases, we bring some of these negative assumptions and attitudes uh, and actions towards others into the workplace. And as a result, we see the resurgence of things like microaggressions, um, bullying, and, and all of these attitudes have been linked to poor mental health and uh, workplace well-being. So uh, according to a 2019 Deloitte report, 70% of Canadian employees are concerned about the psychological safety or their psychological safety um, and health in the workplaces. And then um, a, an article that the Global Mail published in 2017 uh, also said that workplace stress remained the leading cause of employees' mental health issues. Now, this was way before the pandemic, 2019, 2017, those were before the pandemic. So we can already imagine how, how much more intense some of these uh, stresses have become. Also, research is now starting to show us that some of these indignities correlate with decline and people's mental health and physical health. So specifically, it creates inner conflict and chronic stress. And all of these can lead to depression. It can lead to mistrust of others. And it can provoke negative coping mechanisms for um, the targets, such as denial, withdrawal, substance abuse. So for the people who actually are on the receiving end, um, and I don't like to call them victims, I'd rather say they're targets, um, this often results in a feeling of exclusion in the workplace and it contributes to a toxic work environment that is of course going to impact their productivity is going to impact their sense of belonging and it's also going to impact their performance and their relationships with other people around them um, also uh, Deloitte the same um, company published this finding that there's a loss of productivity so annually up to 6.3 billion is lost in productivity due to mental health related abs uh, absences so we also need to activate our allyship because um, affirmative action, as we all know it, deals with loss and allyship deals with human behaviors. So um, I'll explain in just a bit. So affirmative action speaks to the laws, the policies, and the legal structures with the aim of um, increasing diversity and equality. So affirmative action has put into law legal protections for all people um, say regardless of their race, regardless of their sex or their gender and their ability. So it's basically about these laws trying to ensure that minorities who are qualified are employed and that they are promoted in their workplaces. So for example, um, federal contractors and subcontractors um, for federal contractors and subcontractors, affirmative action must be taken by some of these covered employees to recruit and advance qualified minorities. So we're talking about women, we're talking about persons with disabilities, and we're talking about um, veterans as well. So although these laws are done with uh, uh, equality in mind, we know that true inclusion takes human effort. So allyship essentially draws attention to these systemic inequities that are often invisible, that are not really caught by the law, that resurface in everyday interactions. So allyship here focuses on addressing the conscious and unconscious attitudes that reinforce um, the exclusion that some of us experience in society. So basically, when we act in allyship, it enables us first to address systemic issues that are often invisible in a localized context. So um, again, when we are allies, we are able to interrupt a microaggression or a prejudice or uh, a wrong statement when it is happening. Um, allyship also creates opportunities for representation and for passing the mic. So pretty much allowing people from these uh, marginalized groups to advocate for themselves, to say what they need without someone necessarily 
necessarily usurping their voices. And then it also enables us to use our privilege to fight against some of these inequities. Um, and then the final thing is that it helps to create a psychologically safe environment for people to show up authentically. So in a nutshell, acting in allyship, um, these are some of the more practical um, and effective ways of promoting workplace cultures of inclusion and equity. So we have talked a bit about allyship, why it is important for us to um, enact our allyship. But I also mentioned in my introduction about allyship that a big part of it hinges on having privilege. And we must be aware of these privileges in order to be effective allies. And so a lot of self-reflection is required when it comes to um, understanding our privileges and how we can um, effectively use them in being allies. So um, one of the things that I think 2020 made it impossible to ignore for a lot of us was for us to examine our privileges. And I'm sure a lot of us at this point, we are in 2022, getting to the end of 2022, we have a base um, understanding or definition of what privilege is. So um, in a sense, what is privilege? Privilege is unearned access to resources or social power that are only readily available to some people because of their social group membership. It has also been described as an advantage or immunity that is granted to or enjoyed by one societal group above and beyond the common advantage of all other groups. So when we think of privilege, I'm sure a lot of us can come up with different examples of privilege and how um, or how they understand privilege or how privilege shows up. So we all know that there's uh, there are things like cisgender privilege, there are things like um, pretty privilege, we also have financial privilege. Um, we also have educational privilege, linguistic privilege. So um, just understanding the different systems of privilege that are out there and the different systems of non-privilege that exist for other people because of their social identities, it requires for us, those of us wanting to be allies, to actually ask ourselves, what are our diversity dimensions? So um, a, a great deal of how you should leverage your privilege has to do with you, your own self-reflection. So first, it is important for you to examine your own dimensions of diversity. So what are your dimensions of diversity? Um, these are your social identities. So how do you show up in the world? How do you identify to other people in different circumstances? So for example, for me, I identify as a woman. So when we, we talk about your dimensions of diversity, we also refer to your social identity. So your gender, um, your socioeconomic status, your family status, your level of education, um, all of these, your intellectual and physical uh, abilities. So it is important for you to understand, for example, when it comes to your first dimension, in my case, it will be gender because people would see first that I'm a woman um, before they see that I am black. So for my gender, um, how does uh, my gender or how has it influenced my worldview and how has it shaped my experiences? It's, all, it's always important to take stock of these things because uh, the way that you grew up, the way your gender was received, how your gender was treated in a specific context, is uh, in a specific cultural context, is very different than how somebody else's gender was perceived in another context. Another thing to, to take note of is socioeconomic status. So I think a lot of us take for granted that everybody starts off at the same place, you know, so when it comes to socioeconomic status, a lot of it has to do with financial privilege. Um, a lot of it also has to do with not having financial privilege, not having social capital, um, social capital such as networks, your connections, um, the people that you know um, are in your circle, the things that um, the people that you have access to that can help you get a job or help you get an internship or not. Um, then also family status, because that also plays a role in your 
more uh, diversity dimension. So if you're coming from a one parent household, you're coming from a two parent household, a three parent household, uh, an intergenerational family household, all of these have a lot um, of influence. And then your intellectual and physical abilities or um, disabilities. So understand that your diversity dimensions influence your lived experiences and people from marginalized communities may have different experiences. So for instance, if you if you've had um, able-bodied privilege, you may not understand what another person who did not have this went through just to reach um, the same level of education as you. So acknowledging this is a first step to your own self-awareness as an ally, but also to uh, what your potential blind spots could be. And then um, we come down to privilege. So your dimensions of diversity um, are tied to your privilege. So again, here, understand your privilege, your access to social capital, the access to social capital that you have. Um, so for instance, a friend of mine who is working, uh, who worked at an airline was telling me that his colleagues were urging him to take um, advantage of a company's offer or the company's offer to take a vacation uh, to a popular tourist destination. Now, the issue was that even though he was a permanent resident of Canada, traveling to that country meant like going through an extensive visa application process, and that would take longer than the vacation itself. And so the stress of, you know, presenting documents and, you know, traveling to another city to get a visa, paying for visas, it was just mentally exhausting. And his colleagues did not understand that one does not just get up and pack their bags and go to any tourist destination without mm -hmm. having to worry about visa issues. And I say the same thing for um, myself as a black woman, because it's not every tourist destination that I can go to because there are just some places, some cities that are not the safest for a black person to travel to. Um, and then we also come to bias. So in this um, exercise of self-reflection, we also have to talk about bias. So um, Dealing with your bias, a lot of it has to do with understanding your unconscious and your conscious biases and learning how to manage them. So it's here it's important for you to question uh, some of these quick conclusions that you have about other groups. So for example, there's a stereotype of other groups being lazy or uncooperative or not showing enthusiasm for whatever opportunity that they have been given. So um, ask yourself whether these thoughts are coming from popular stereotypes stereotypes about them or coming from your own interaction and your own knowledge about some of these people who come from these groups. Um, so the, the, the final part of this is for you to do an inventory of your own personal strengths and your interests. So first think about your skill sets. Um, the resources that you have, the social capital that you have, the capabilities, the talent, et cetera. So um, do this inventory. And I encourage you to do this exercise with this question in mind. What do I have that can help me be an ally? So for instance, um, in my case, and I use myself as an example, because I'm the best, like I know myself best. Um, I have public public speaking skills, uh, skills, those are my strengths. I also have great research skills. And um, so another question you could ask yourself, what are your strengths? What are the things that you have that can make you an effective ally? Um, you could also ask yourself questions like, if you have that level of privilege, am I in a position to give opportunities to, to, to people from equity deserving groups who are not visible? right? Do I have connections to media people, for example? Do I have access to a highly visible platform? Um, if you have a blog where you get about, I don't know, 1,000 hits a day, maybe. Um, also reflect on um, the causes that interest you. So what type of change or what change, what concrete change would you like to see happen in your community? And um, finally, I'm going to say this as part of leveraging your own privilege is to educate yourself. So there are several resources on the internet to help educate you on the social issues that um, a lot of people from equity deserving groups face. Now, if you mistrust Google, um, and I know there's a lot of um, non-factual information out on Google in addition to the factual information, you can reach out to nonprofit organizations in your area that are advocating for these groups and you can learn 
from them. So you can also educate yourself to understand how um, your behavior or your silence may also be harmful to others. So in a sense, this self-awareness um, exercise helps us to decenter ourselves uh, from the group that we are looking to partner with. And in a sense, having this level of self-awareness will make um, us be able to be more confident in the way that we want to show up as an ally. So, um, in a sense, how a person shows up as an ally depends a lot on the privilege that they have. It depends on their interest. It also depends on their own diversity dimensions, as well as the context in which they find themselves. So um, right now, we're going to look at some types of allies and how they show up in everyday life. So how does an ally show up? First, uh, we have the sponsor. The sponsor is an ally who uses their assets to support colleagues from equity deserving groups. We also have the scholar. So a scholar is an ally who learns to understand the challenges faced by marginalized group members. And then we have the confidant. The confidant is the one who creates and maintains safe spaces for members of underrepresented groups. And then we have the champion. So the champion is the one who voluntarily defers to colleagues from equity deserving groups. And we have the advocate, the one who uses their privilege to address unjust omissions and exclusions of underrepresented colleagues. And then we have the amplifier, the, the person who ensures that representation within communication um, is diverse and that people um, from all different backgrounds are factored in when decisions are made. And then we have the upstander. So the upstander is the one who pushes back and acts against wrongdoing when it is happening, not after it has happened. So right now I want us to take a look at each of these individually. So the first one we're going to look at is the sponsor. So um, a sponsor, as I just described, is an ally who uses their assets to support colleagues from equity deserving groups to advance in their careers. So um, for the sponsor, the sponsor actually re uh, recognizes that social capital is a form of privilege and they have it. And using that capital to help um, individual groups is what they can do to support that group or to help that group advance or that person in that instance. So for example, um, sharing their personal network connections to proactively help uh, their colleagues get new opportunities or for employees to gain new skills. Um, at the organizational level, it can look like creating paid internship opportunities for individuals from equity deserving groups who are underrepresented in a specific field or industry, um, giving them access to networking events, career development opportunities, Etc. And here I just want to share two examples of um, organizations who are acting as sponsors within this capacity. So um, the first example is um, the Canadian Venture Capital and Private Equity Association. So uh, one of their DEI priorities was building a diverse uh, talent pipeline. And so um, this organization launched um, their pilot internship for Black, Indigenous, and people of color uh, in partnership with um, another nonprofit organization. And so at the end of uh, you know this um, mandate or this pilot program, they had recruited or they had nominated and placed 10 BIPOC students from um, Canadian um, universities into 10 of their member firms as paid interns for the fall of uh, 2021. And they will continue to support this cohort with bi-weekly lunch and learn events and networking. So um, according to their figures, at least 50% of the candidates that they put forward were women from racialized communities because women from racialized communities were the most underrepresented group in private capital. Now, the second example I have here for you is um, what um, the National Gallery of uh, Canadian Conservation is also doing. So um, they also have an internship program for diversity, which aims to increase the representation of professionals from different communities. So their program is um, specifically dedicated to Indigenous and Black students and um, students from other cultural communities across Canada. So the program uh, 
is 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 conceived with the idea of giving a lot of these um, BIPOC interested um, candidates the opportunity to have a good start in the career and also to help them, uh, you know, tap into the expertise of the, the the professionals that they already have within that organization. So um, yes, these are two organizations that are doing great work. You can always look them up and learn more about what they are doing to be sponsors to um, a lot of um, students who are in equity deserving groups who want to start a career in this area. Our second type of ally that we're going to look at is the scholar. So um, a scholar is an ally who learns to understand the challenges faced by marginalized groups and shares that knowledge. So it is a conscious effort to not burden the marginalized with constantly educating us on the inequities that they face regularly. So um, an example of how a scholar can show up is um, by creating and circulating a resources folder on creating a psychologically safe space for people with diverse sexual identities, for example, or um, maybe researching to understand if employees or colleagues in your workplaces feel seen and heard, um, and then partnering with institutions to help educate on um, issues equity deserving groups face. Um, so in my experience, um, a prof um, reached out to um, us, and this was a professor who specialized, I believe, in anti-Semitism, he reached out um, wanting to share that knowledge and to ask if there were education opportunities that um, we give out for people who want to learn about anti-Semitism. So um, these are all ways that people can use or leverage the knowledge to educate people um, on um, being a scholar or to educate people about the, the, the issues that a lot of marginalized groups face and how they can be a part of the solution instead of remaining silent. Now, the next type of ally I want us to look at is the confidant. And I feel the confidant doesn't get um, a lot of shine, especially when we're talking about the types of allies and how people can show up as allies. So a confidant is an ally who creates and maintains safe spaces for members of underrepresented groups. So this comes from understanding that workplaces uh, can be microcosms of the larger society, and they can be psychologically unsafe spaces for uh, marginalized groups. So um, a great part of being um, a confidant is, is very personal, and that is you yourself being a safe person for colleagues to confide in. Now, um, it's important to know that you cannot just jump from, you know, being uh, the loudest, the meanest person to all of a sudden being the confidant. It requires that people have trust in you. They already had trust in you before you um, coming out to say, oh, you can confide in me. Um, I don't think I would walk to a person who I've, uh, who has quite the reputation for being loud. And if they told me they were confident, there's no way I'm saying two things to them. Um, so a part of this requires you not being judgmental. You're listening to understand, you ask questions and also believing and not trying to rationalize or to downplay or to insert your own opinions uh, of the experience. So if somebody was in the same room with you and they thought something happened towards them, that was a microaggression, um, a confidant never says, oh, I didn't see that. I thought this person was just being funny, right? Everybody experiences things different ways. And also another part or another important part is um, designating your one-on-one -on -one meetings as safe or confidential and making sure that whatever is spoken within these confines doesn't go out of these confines without the person's um, express permission. The other type of ally that I need us to look at is the champion. Now, a champion is an ally who voluntarily defers to colleagues from equity um, deserving groups in meetings, in conferences, um, organizational assignments and projects. So a champion contributes to reimagining what expertise looks like in a specific industry or a field or an organization. And um, ways that you can be a, a champion is by recommending a colleague who you know would like a chance at a project, um, championing the visibility of underrepresented groups in organizational and public events, and then publicly endorsing and sharing how their work contributes to the team's goals.
Now let's look at the advocate. I think the advocate is by far the most popular kind of ally that we see, um, especially on social media. So an advocate is a person who uses their privilege to address unjust omissions and exclusions of underrepresented colleagues. So this advocacy is based on the awareness that um, once privilege provides access to network that marginalized uh, colleagues may not have. So an example example of how people can be effective advocates is by inviting colleagues to share their opinions, especially when they're repeatedly interrupted by stronger voices in the room, or they can use their power and influence to have peers from marginalized groups invited to strategic planning meetings, career development opportunities to conference, or even to collaborate on projects. Now, the amplifier, the amplifier um, as an ally is an individual who strives for representation within communication, and they ensure that a wide range of voices are considered when decisions are being made. So amplifiers understand that underrepresented groups are often left out of important conversations and they attempt to rectify that. So an example or one way we can be an ally, for example, is alerting leadership to the missing voices uh, within a policy draft and asking for their opinions and perspectives to be considered. Um, you can also invite members of underrepresented groups in your organizations to speak at staff meetings or to write company newsletters or to take on some roles with a little more visibility. Now, the final um, type of ally that I want us to look at is the upstander. Um, so the upstander is a person who pushes back and acts against wrongdoing when it is happening and not after it has happened. So upstanders understand that injustices occur regularly. And in speaking up, they help the underrepresented see that they are not alone, even as they call out the perpetrator. So um, upstanders usually are people who intervene, especially when a microaggression is happening. Um, so an example of being an upstander is that you can speak up or you can call out speech, jokes, or behavior that is wrong or offensive. Um, you can also report when some someone is being bullied, they're being harassed or discriminated against, or you can show shut down off topic comments and questions that are made to uh, that are meant to make a person uncomfortable and um being an upstander is the opposite of being a bystander. So I'm sure that a lot of us um, saw the, the video of the Lyft driver who shut down the passenger who said, thank God you're white and you speak English or something of that sort. So this was an insult to other Lyft drivers who didn't speak English. And basically this um, Lyft driver in question refused to drive them and the whole exchange was captured on camera. So I also wanted to mention that being an upstander um, is also like critical, especially when marginalized people are not around. So this um, guy gave us the perfect example of what it meant to be um, an upstander, whether you are with the people or not with um, the people that you are allies to. All right, so um, I did promise a case study at the beginning. And so here is the case study that I have for you. So um, this is it. Donna is a healthcare manager who also leads the DEI committee at your workplace. A few days ago, she confided to you that she might not be retained in her role. Her senior manager had expressed disappointment about her immediate, uh, intermediate proficiency in HLCX, the new CRM that her organization used to manage its operations and employees. You recently collaborated on two projects with her and found that although she relied on a manual process to get her work done. She was extremely skilled and an important pillar in her department. Management recently announced a policy that gave everyone two weeks to be highly proficient in the new CRM. So despite her two decades expertise in healthcare administration, Donna is afraid she would be let go. If this happened, it would be a great loss for your organization, as well as the minority groups that rely on the services it provides them. So right now, I want us to take a minute to reflect on this scenario and to ask yourself with the different types of allies that we just looked at, how would you demonstrate your allyship in this particular scenario? 
how would you demonstrate your allyship in this scenario? So um, when I tested this with my team, um, everybody had different ways of um, how they would show up for Donna, how they would be an ally. And of course, as I mentioned, it depends on um, how what your interests are, what your diversity dimensions are, what your capabilities are, what you are able to offer in that uh, particular instance. Um, so I had a few um, ideas that I wanted to share with you. So first, I think that if Donna were my friend, I would show up as a confidant, first of all. So I would listen, I would ask questions, and I would keep a continuous learning mindset um, just because I want to understand exactly what Donna's fears are, what her main difficulty is with this new CRM. And then if I'm proficient, I could offer to train Donna on the new CRM. Now, if um, I wanted to show up as an upstander, I could also say something to management about how unfair this is, especially given the fact that Donna is an expert in this area. And then if I went advocate, I could um, also advocate or push for policy and process change and say that um, this is not fair to her, that this policy needs to be changed. So these are some of the ways that given my own capabilities, what I'm able to do, I could help Donna with. Now, a lot of us um, ask ourselves, like, um, while you are using some of the tools that you have been given, um, being human, pretty much you are human 100% of the time. And so once you're human in any uh, context, you're bound to make mistakes. And so what happens when you make a mistake as an ally? And these things happen. So first of all, when you make a mistake, it is important to be humble. So first, listen. Um, and then practice self-awareness. And then also try to understand how your actions were harmful. Maybe I realize that um, sometimes somebody can say they're offended and I don't understand what the offense was, but when they, uh, when they then explain to me how these actions were harmful to them, it makes much more sense to me. And then also apologizing and accepting responsibility and then learning from that mistake. So understand that it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to be imperfect. So allow yourselves, your teams, and your leaders to make mistakes, uh, but also be quick to forgive um, because they are also trying to learn. Remember, we did say that allyship is about continuous learning. All right, so at this point, um, I just wanted to leave you with um, a couple of things, more like homework for you. So um, my question to you now is for you to reflect, how are you going to show up as an ally in your workplace? So first I need you to create an inventory of your own um, diversity dimensions, your um, privilege, your strengths, your skill sets, your talent, your capabilities, and your interests. What are the things that interest you? What is the change that you want to see in your community? All right, so um, to sum up everything that we have discussed so far, uh, we have talked about allyship, we've talked about what allyship is, how we can be allies. We've also talked about leveraging our privilege in terms of understanding how we're showing up in the world and what tools we have within us that we can use to um, support marginalized groups to end discrimination and systems of oppression for them. We also learned about the different types of allies and how we can show up in any different number of ways. We looked at a case study. And at this point, I believe um, we're going to move into our Q&A. So I'm going to pass the mic back to our moderator, Neelab. Uh, once again, thank you all so much for joining me for this webinar, for this discussion on allyship. Um, if anything, I hope you have taken with you, you know, um, the three things on how to leverage your privilege to be an effective ally. And you have learned at least one thing about yourself that you can use uh, to be an effective ally to to another group within your own circle uh thank you and um enjoy the rest of your afternoon over to you Neelab. 
Thank you very much, Sarita, for that fantastic presentation. Uh, we now have some time for some questions. To participate, you may type your question in the Q&A chat box on your screen. Only Sarita or I can see your questions. Uh, to manage the questions as smoothly as possible, we will address them in the order in which they appear. Uh, if we run out of time, you can send us your questions to research at ccdi.ca, which I can drop the email address in the chat for you, and we can answer them over email. Uh, just please allow about 10 business days for responses. We do receive a large volume of inquiries. Um, and we do have a large number of questions that are coming in. Um, granted, this was a one of our bigger webinars. Uh, so again, we do appreciate your patience uh, as we get through them. And again, if we don't get to your question, uh, please feel free to email us. All right. Yes, so I was wondering, Nilab, did you have any questions for me? I'm just going through. We have a ton here, so let's see. Wow. <laughs> Okay, great. Uh, so the first question can be, um, sorry, they just come in so fast sometimes, we just go right by them. Um, how do you know if you are being a good ally versus if you are overstepping and speaking for a group of people that you aren't a part of when they can very well speak for themselves? Wow. How do you know you're not speaking for a group of people when they can very well speak for themselves? Okay, so the first question to ask yourself in that instance is, are you centering yourself? Um, if you know that they can speak for themselves, the other question then would be, why are they not speaking for themselves? Did you pass them the mic? Um, did you give them the platform for them to share? Did you prepare, uh, prepare the audience, you know, to hear what this group has to say? Um, I'll give you an example. So um, I'm a lighter skinned black woman. A lot, my, my sister is darker skinned and um, she faces a lot of colorism and I didn't have to go through that, but I was a blogger in a previous life. So when I started seeing a lot of these things, I, I, I started blogging about, you know, dark skin privilege, but then it wasn't as authentic. So then I was like, okay, why don't you talk about it? And of course, when she started talking about it, it sort of like took, you know, it came with a storm of its own. So it was also a big question for me. I can be within the Black community and say that I am trying to be an ally, but in some way I could also pass the mic and be a much better ally so that people can talk about their experiences from their own um, point of view. So these are some things that you can consider um, in terms of thinking. And the final tip I would give you is to ask the people, do you think in doing this I'm overstepping? Do you think in speaking this way I'm taking over your narrative? Um, so yeah, these are some tips uh, for how you can make sure that you are being in line without necessarily overstepping those boundaries. Thank you so much, Sarita. I uh, would say we have another some time for another question here. Um, sure. What can what can be said of sponsor who is an ally due to their social status, but at the same time engage in exploitive exploitive behaviors that impact uh, marginalized people? Okay, <laughs> so this this is a very um, this is a very complex one um, because I. I I see there are some organizations that end up falling into this pit. Um, you cannot be a sponsor um, and then exploit people on the one hand. So you cannot be doing good with one hand and be doing wrong with the other hand. So I think pretty much it is a, a, a conversation that has to be put to the so-called sponsor to get them to take stock of what it is that they're doing to harm this community, but also to help them see that, okay, on the one hand you're doing this, but on the other hand you're doing that. So sometimes I think just presenting the facts to the sponsor would help help them see. Um, and also um, understand this, that what you see may not necessarily be what the other person sees. So maybe if they are brought around to your side of the table, to your vision as in terms of what you see, what you experience, maybe then they would be able to take, you know, stock of what um, their actions are, the impact of their actions. Thank you very much, Sarita. I'm just trying to see here, we have a couple of minutes left. I have one here that says a confidant sounds very much like a person who empathizes or sympathizes, but it was stated that allyship is neither of these things. So where is the action with the confidant? 
Okay, really good one. So a confidant uh, would sound like someone who's very, very passive, who doesn't do anything, but a confidant actually has a role to play when it comes to being, being an ally. So a confidant can basically be that person that offers you a safe space. So for example, as I, uh, as I used in the Donna example, that if I were Donna's confidant, I would then ask myself, what is it that I know that I can use to support Donna? So in a sense, you listening, you creating that space for them to tell you what it is that um, they're experiencing also gives you the opportunity to ask them what it is that they need. And if you have that tool or that help within, you know, the resources that you carry as a person, then you are able to take the next step. So a confidant is definitely um, not a person who's super passive. There is something there is something more to being a confidant. It's just the first step. And then once you've heard them out, this is what um, you can do. Um, also, a confidant can be somebody that you can call on when, say, like, um, you have made claims of discrimination or some kind of disrespect in the workplace against you. Now, this person was there, they heard these experiences from you. And if they are the confidant that they are for you, then they can step in as a witness for you in that instance. So in a sense, a confidant is not a super passive person. They are not always offering sympathy. They're just there to listen. But at the same time, they are also listening to take action in the future. Thank you very much for that, uh, Sarita. Um, that is all the time we do have for today. Again, as a reminder, you can send your questions to research at ccdi.ca. Um, and just as a reminder, this webinar is recorded and placed in our knowledge repository, which is exclusive to employer partners of CCDI. Uh, if you wanted instructions on how to access the knowledge repository, please email events at ccdi.ca and we can uh, assist you with that. Again, thank you very much, uh, Sarita, for your uh, expertise and the wonderful presentation. I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you all. Great conversation. Have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed today's presentation. For more information on upcoming events, please visit our website at ccdi.ca.